Uh, good evening and welcome. I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this Beyond the Headlines discussion featuring Charles A. Cupchin, author of No One's World, Thank you. The West, The Rising Rest, and The Coming Global Turn. The matter of the West or of America's role in the 21st century is getting a lot of authorial attention these days with a number of notable books coming out on the subject that tend to take as their departure point the West diminished place in the world and how that will affect its power and influence. Charles Kupchin's new book puts him in the company of, among others, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Fareed Zakaria, John Eikenberry, Robert Kagan, and the British newspaper man author Edward Luce, who have all published books that deal with U.S. decline. Charlie is not a declinist, as he argued eloquently in the New York Times op-ed this past Sunday. And he is also no Charlie come lately to this subject. In 2002, fully 10 years ago, he published a book entitled The End of the American Era, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Geopolitics of the 21st Century. So how attention getting is this subject 10 years later? The website of Foreign Policy Magazine now has a dedicated blog called Decline Watch. <laughs> and it's hard to imagine a set of circumstances that would have made allies, even for a moment, of Robert Kagan, the assertive neoconservative writer who is still cheerleading for the American war in Iraq, and President Obama, who opposed that war and claims proudly to have brought it to an end. But the president, eager to fend off Republican claims that the U.S. was losing its international impact on his watch, had himself photographed one recent weekend, very publicly carrying under his arm Kagan's The World America Made that makes the case that claims of America's decline are grossly exaggerated. And speaking of Iraq, can I mention as an aside that the evening last month that Charlie presented his book at the Council on Foreign Relations was also the day that he became a father. <laughs> and Charlie remarked that he finally knew the meaning of the phrase shock and awe. <laughs> <laughs> now, all the books that I mentioned take differing points of view on the subject, but they tend to agree that American power or Chinese power or some amalgam of the two, you may remember Neil Ferguson's Chimerica, will remain dominant in the 21st century. Where Charlie comes out on that is reflected by the title of his book that says that no one will own the world. The next world, he writes, will not march to the Washington consensus, the Beijing consensus, or the Brasilia consensus. It will march to no consensus. Rather, the world is headed towards a global dissensus. Now that sounds pretty ominous, but I looked at the Merriam-Webster website and came away feeling assured because it says that, quote, democracy depends upon dissensus as much as it does on consensus. Nor is Charlie's thesis a grim one. He doesn't fight the evidence that the West power is diminishing. He instead spends much of the book describing how the West can best reshape that diminished power to maintain influence. And he buttresses his theory with fascinating detail of how the West over several centuries came to have that power in the first place and how others are now accumulating power based on very different historical models that the West needs to understand better. As you are about to see and hear, Charlie, a professor of international affairs at Georgetown, has that ability that the best teachers do for delivering lots of pertinent information in a very accessible manner. I want to finish this brief introduction by telling you how I found that out for myself. When I was the London Bureau Chief of the New York Times a decade ago and needed a quote for a story I was writing on how Tony Blair was starting to stumble in Europe, I placed a call to Charlie, who was then Director of Europe Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations 
in Washington. So responsive and concise was he that I called him a few more times in the years that followed. And then, and I didn't remember this until I visited the Times website over the past weekend, I sought him out again once I had returned to New York and become the United Nations Bureau Chief. I was writing a story on Kofi Annan and some damaging disclosures in the oil for food scandal, and Charlie had pithy and publishable comments on that too. <laughs> By the way, I was pleased with myself to see that another person I reached out to to quote in that 2005 UN article was a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution named Susan Rice. <laughs> So now that I'm at IPI, I'm delighted to still be able to turn for insight to the rich intellectual resource that is Charles A. Cupshin. Charlie, welcome to IPI. Thank you uh, very much, Warren, for the, for the warm uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be here at, uh, at IPI and to have an opportunity to have a conversation with you this evening uh, the only problem is that Warren just did such a good job of not only teeing up my book, but describing my book that I, I really don't have much more to say. Uh, but I, I will do my best to uh, elaborate a little bit on the, the themes that you just elegantly Can I just tell you, um, Mark Malik Brown came here about a year ago to talk about his book. Yeah. And I, I went on and on about his book. And at the end, Mark and I said, well, this is an interesting thing. Uh, Warren describes the book, and then I asked the question. So <laughs> that was much worse than this. I, okay. You've got a lot of good lines. I've got them all here, and I'll okay. save them for you. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be brief since you've already uh, got, got us going, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a good bit of time for a, a conversation. The, the debate that Warren just described is upon us today, I think, for a, a fairly obvious reason. Uh, and that is that if you step back from the headlines, you can sense that there seems to be a structural shift taking place in international politics. The part of the world that we live in, the United States, and I would put Europe in the same category and Japan in that same category, the, the West, we are going through a bit of a tough patch. Our economies are all stuck in neutral. Our political systems are stuck in reverse. We don't seem to have a recipe for solving either of those problems and getting us back on the path of either economic or political solvency. Uh, I'm not a declinist, as you just aptly said, and so I'm relatively confident that we will find our way out of this cul-de-sac, but I don't have a recipe for doing that, and I don't think that we yet see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and as a consequence, this moment that we're in is not a moment. It appears to be something that is more deeply rooted. And the fact that the United States, Europe, and Japan are simultaneously experiencing digest indigestion simultaneously finding it difficult to govern. That cannot be accidental. It says to me something is going on here that is shared among those countries that have been at the front of history for the better part of a century. And the other thing that you would notice is that the other areas of the world, East Asia in particular, but also the Middle East, Latin America, to some extent Africa, although less so, there is a new wind in the sails. China has been enjoying almost 10% growth. It's now slowing down, but they'll still be 8 plus percent. It's a lot better than the United States. It's a lot better than France. It's hoping for 0.2% this year. The Brazilians, the Indonesians, the Turks, the Indians, there is a sense that they are on the make. They are on the rise. They are not just experiencing economic growth, but their governments are enjoying a new level of legitimacy. Turkey has suddenly woken up, is extending its reach in what some people call a neo-Ottoman foreign policy. In other words, there is an awakening in what we have traditionally called the developing world. 
And what I want to suggest is that <clears throat> this weakening of the fortunes of the West, the strengthening that's taking place elsewhere, is part of what I would call a global turn, a moment in history in which the globe's center of gravity is starting to move again. The last time that happened was three or 400 years ago. In the year 1600 or 1700, power was broadly diffused across the globe. The Holy Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Mughal Empire, the Qing Dynasty, and the Tokugawa Shogunate, all not equal, but power centers that were spread across what today would be Europe and Eurasia. If you fast forward to 1815, or certainly 1900, the picture had dramatically changed. Europe, and then the United States along with it, sprinted ahead of those other centers of power. And by the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, and with the onset of European imperialism, the West effectively established global hegemony that has lasted to this day. Between 1815 and 1914, it was under the guise of Pax Britannica. We then had a two-decade interregnum. And then from World War II until today, essentially Western hegemony under American stewardship. And what is, I think, interesting about that period is that it has been both material primacy and ideological primacy, material in the sense that the United States and Europe together represented about 75% of GDP. That's down to 50% now, but that's still a lot. And ideological, in the sense that history has moved forward in the direction of the Western model, liberal democracy, secular politics, and industrial capitalism. And there is a sense best I think captured by Frank Fukuyama at the end of the Cold War, that history was ending. That we have figured out how to get from Neanderthals and cavemen to a historical endpoint. And that historical endpoint has been blazed, has been found by the West. And it's now only a matter of time before everyone else arrives. They will take their own paths. They will move at different paces, but they will get there. Well, I think what is happening today is that that sense of the end of history, that era, roughly 200 year period, of the ideological and material primacy of the Western world is beginning to end. It's not over yet, but it is beginning to end. And as Warren indicated, and as the title of the book suggests, I don't think that the pendulum is swinging to China or Asia in general, or anywhere else, it is swinging everywhere, and therefore nowhere. The 21st century will not be America's, it will not be China's, it will not be India's. We are going toward a world that for the first time in history will be globalized and interdependent, but without a political center of gravity. We've had multipolar worlds with multiple versions of governance and commerce before, 1700 would be one of them. But it didn't matter that the Qing and the Ottomans and the Holy Roman Empire had very different conceptions of religion, politics, and commerce because they didn't interact with each other. They lived in separate worlds. And occasionally, a ship would go from Europe to China, or a European banker or trader would go into the Ottoman world and set up a store but they generally lived separate compartmentalized lives. That's not true anymore. We are all smushed together. And what Beijing decides affects life here. What Washington decides affects life in Brasilia. What Brasilia decides affects life in Europe. And that's why I think we're headed toward what will be an unprecedented moment in history. Integrated, globalized, but without a dominant political model, without a dominant center of gravity. So that's the core argument that I make in the book. It's the core argument that I want to put on the table tonight. Let me take another 15 minutes or so to put a little flesh on the bones, uh, and then I'll turn it over uh, back to, to Warren. <clears throat> 
I want to start by digressing historically to talk about how the West became the West. And I think that's interesting in and of itself, but it's also important because one of the key issues that those of us who care about foreign policy and global politics need to debate is this question of one path to modernity or multiple paths to modernity. And what would separate myself from Walter Mead, some of you may have seen his piece in the Wall Street Journal Monday, or my colleague John Eikenberry, is that they believe that the world that we live in, the Western world, is a universalizable world. That the Chinese and the Brazilians and the Indonesians and the Turks are chafing at the bit to get into it. All we need to do is fling open the doors, invite them into the room, and they will take their seats at the table. They will dock in the harbor at the berth that we have assigned them. And that is true if, in fact, they are converging toward a Western identity and a Western version of modernity and politics and commerce. And to answer that question, are they, in fact, doing that, the first question I think you have to ask is, who are we? How did the West become the West? Did our path of development blaze a trail that others are following, or was it unique and based upon unique socioeconomic and cultural traditions? And to answer that question, I want to start by going back to the year 900 or 1,000, because I think that's when the story of the rise of the West begins. And it begins in weakness. When the Carolingian Empire fell and it was replaced by the Holy Roman Empire, one of the unique features of that transition was the beginning of feudalism, the privatization of property, the opening of feudal territories that began to push back against the vertical lines of authority that had been enforced by the church and by the monarchy. And what you began to see from a thousand on is the fragmentation of the Holy Roman Empire as the church, the nobility, and the monarchy began to fight with each other. The emperor fought the pope, the abbots fought the priests, the nobility fought with each other, and into the political space that was opened up by those contests walked the emerging bourgeoisie the blacksmiths, the tool makers, the printers, the guys who started to write contracts, the guys who understood insurance and nascent forms of credit. In other words, an emerging bourgeoisie. And they left the feudal manors and they founded cities, small commercial cities, mainly along the rivers of Central and Northern Europe, and then they started to ally with each other. Some of you may be familiar with the Hanseatic League, one of the great commercial alliances that formed once the bourgeoisie began to establish its control of trade. And what one began to see through this commercialization was the growing power of the, of the commercial class. And in the first instance, the growing power of the commercial class brought around political and religious pluralism. The Reformation, in the first instance, in which it was that commercial class that greeted and embraced the messages of Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and other Protestant theologians. And that then led to the second big turn. Political pluralism followed religious pluralism. Why? Because the wars of the Reformation were expensive. Monarchs needed bureaucracies and armies to fight them. And they needed money to pay for them. Where was the money? In the hands of that commercial class. What did the commercial class want in return? Voice. And it was that bargain, money for political power, that gave birth to constitutional monarchy in 1688 with the Glorious Revolution in England. And then that then spread to the continent and ultimately, Europe became the home, the instigator, the birthplace of liberal politics. And then it spread across to this side of the Atlantic. 
That story is about the rise of the middle class, the ability of the middle class to push back against the absolute state and the church. And that cleared the way for the Industrial Revolution. And I think the Industrial Revolution not only enabled the West to pull ahead of the rest, but completed the package, liberal democracy, secular nationalism, and capitalism. And it's that package that has been dominant ideologically since 1815. The question then is, is that package going to win over the rest of the world? I don't think it is debatable that we are witnessing the beginnings of a major shift in power. Bob Kagan would differ. Bob Kagan is wrong. <laughs> And that's simply because the numbers don't lie. We live in a world in which sometime in the next decade, China will have a GDP larger than ours. The World Bank identifies 2025 as the year in which we will live in a three currency world, the dollar, the renminbi, and the euro. In 2032, according to Goldman Sachs, the BRICS countries, the emerging major countries in the developing world will have a GDP equal today to the G7. And within about 30 to 40 years, the top five powers economically in the world, only one of them will be in the West, and that's us. We'll come in at number two, and our economy will be about half the size of China's. Today. We still live in a world in which, of the five top economies, four are Western. One makes the cut, China, it's at number two. So over those next decades, the world is going to go upside down. We will do fine. We will be at or near the top of the pack for a long time to come. But the West is not us. The West has consisted of an alliance that has spanned the globe. And that unit, US, Europe, Japan, as I said, has gone from 75 to 50, and it will soon be 40% of global product. The numbers don't lie. We know those projections will, won't be perfect. We know what China may surpass us in 2024 rather than 2027, or maybe 2030 rather than 2027. But the picture is out there. Power is shifting. The pendulum is swinging. So why am I not more confident that even though our primacy in a material sense will wane, that our values and our, our version of modernity will not replicate itself globally? Let me just give you a sense of the kinds of arguments I make in the book. Let's start with China. If the story of the West is about the emergence of an autonomous and wealthy and powerful middle class, is the same thing happening in China today? The answer, in my mind, is definitively no. And that's because the Chinese state is much smarter than the states of early modern Europe, who fought hard to keep the bourgeoisie out of politics. The Chinese have done exactly the opposite. They have flung open the doors and they have won over the middle class. Deng Xiaoping decided at the end of the 1970s to privatize the Chinese economy. And then there was a huge fight in the CCP about whether businessmen could become party members. And the party until that time was mostly peasants and soldiers. And the party fought it out. And those who said, we have no choice but to bring in businessmen won. And ever since then, the CCP and the Chinese middle class have been like this. And the Chinese middle class is the beneficiary of state capitalism. And yes, there are some dissidents. Yes, there are a few pushing back. But the broad swath of China's population that has entered the middle class is, favors the status quo. They are not the vanguard of democratization. A recent Pew poll said to the Chinese populace, how many of you believe your country is headed in the right direction? 83% said yes. The same question in this country, 
is 23%. That kind of popularity for the Chinese regime doesn't suggest to me that they are on the cusp of embracing a new political ethic. I'm not someone who believes that China will never be a democracy. It may well be a democracy, but it's not going to be a democracy before it's a global power. I'll bet you on that. These things take time. Britain became a, a constitutional monarchy in 1688. When did it become a democracy? 1884, 200 years. Prussia became a constitutional monarchy, sort of. After the revolutions of 1848, Germany became a democracy after World War II. That was pretty quick, only 100 years. So for those of us who think that trade with China and the emergence of a Chinese middle class is about to push the country into the democratic column, I think that uh, you're going to be holding your breath for a very long time. Middle East. Some of you may be thinking, well, he might be right about China, but he's wrong about the Middle East because the Arab Spring means that that part of the world is breaking America's way. Democracy is spreading. And I think that that's actually right. That we will see the spread of participatory politics in a part of the world for, where many people said it will never happen because Islam and democracy are incompatible. But what emerges in the Middle East over the next few decades will not be a secular brand of democracy of the sort that emerged in the West after the Reformation. And keep in mind that in the West, it took a lot of dead people and a very long time for us to embrace a secular brand of politics. And in fact, in places like the Balkans and in Northern Ireland and a few other places, we're still not there yet. But what I think we are witnessing in the Middle East is a part of the world that has a very different approach to the relationship between religion and politics than in our part of the world. There has never been a separation between the sacred and the secular in the Muslim world. There has never been an emperor fighting with a pope because they had one leader who was both the secular leader and the religious leader. Sure, there have been many secular regimes in the Middle East, but they were secular by coercion. And as participatory politics comes to the region, the one thing that seems to be surely coming with it is political Islam. And Egypt, which we read about every day, is the rule, and it is not the exception. In every country where, where we have seen elections of one sort or another, it is political Islam that has been the beneficiary. Algeria, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Lebanon, Palestinian Authority. Turkey is in some ways the best example because Turkey is supposed to be like us. They're supposed to be modernizing, middle class. They're, they're secular, they're the model. Well, what's happening? The more wealthy Turkey gets, the bigger its middle class, the stronger the AKP is becoming. That's the party that is, quote unquote, Islamist. I am not in any way saying that this is bad or scary or anything else. I'm saying it's different. And that the spread of democracy in the Middle East is welcome. It's about time. But it is going to create a different version of modernity with a different way of thinking about commerce and politics and sovereignty and legitimacy than the Western model. Finally, Brazil, India, other countries that are already secular democracies, I think they too are forging their own brands of modernity, partly because they are democratizing when most of their countries are still rural and urban poor, not middle class. And that is creating a left-wing populism that is uncomfortable with open markets and somewhat skeptical of representative institutions that many people feel are hijacked by a privileged elite. On foreign policy, Brazil, India are supposed to be our new allies because they are democracies. President Obama went to India recently and anointed the country as our new strategic partner. Look at the facts. We disagree with India on everything but containing China. 
on Afghanistan, on Pakistan, on climate change, on trade, the issue at the top of our national security agenda today is Iran. We are trying to tighten the screws on Iran daily. New Delhi just dispatched a trade mission to Tehran and is deepening its commercial integration with the country. That suggests to me that if we think that countries will ally with us just because they are democracies, we should think again. And that emerging democracies are not going to take the birth that we have assigned them. They will be with us on some days, and they will be with us some other days. And since behind me stands the UN, I would simply point out that when it comes to voting in that august body, Brazil and India vote with the United States about 20% of the time. Let me end with some thoughts on what we do about this. In terms of uh, the United States, uh, I think there are two things we need to do to prepare for a world where American democracy, American capitalism, the Western way, will need to compete in the marketplace of ideas in a way that it never really has. The first is to get our own house back in order. That's priority number one, two, three, four, and five. Because if our institutions of government are as, are as gummed up as they are today, not only will we not fix the economy, but we will not be able to serve as a model for the rest of the world, because other countries including state capitalist countries that are not democratic, will have an appeal that we do not, simply because they show more competence than we do. And if our bridges and tunnels and highways and airports are falling apart, while Japan is building high-speed trains and opening airports and building a new high-speed interstate network, countries are going to look out at the Chinese model and they're going to say, that's not so bad. So we've got to compete with them, but we've got to do it in a way that restores confidence in our brand of modernity. And right now, our brand of modernity has been tarnished. And we can talk in the, in the conversation about what some of the steps may be, but I do think this is not just a, 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 a short moment a passing weakness. It is deeply rooted in globalization, in the loss of jobs, and the return to American politics of economic cleavages that have not been there since World War II in our campaign finance system. We got a lot of problems we need to tackle. Final point, if we actually get our house in order, and the jury remains out on that, I think the imperative for foreign policy is to recognize that the world is changing, to recognize that the globe is turning, and that there are alternative packages of ideas out there that we need to contend with and with which we need to compromise. The biggest mistake we can make is to either stick our heads in the sand or assume that everybody wants to look like us. The greatest step forward would be to sit down with the Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians, and the others and say, what should the rules of the next road be? How should we define legitimacy, sovereignty? How do we tame globalization? How do we fight inequality? Let's put our heads together and answer those questions. So in many respects, the challenge that I think the West has before it is to do for the rest of the world what the West did for itself three or four hundred years ago. Number one, accept pluralism. Accept a world where different cultures and different peoples find their own versions of modernity. And two, accept the diffusion of power. Because when the monarchs and the church shared power with the workers and the middle class, good results happen. And if the West finds in itself the readiness to share power with the emerging world, 
then I think the 21st century, even though it's no one's world, may well be one of the most stable and prosperous centuries in history. And I think it's much better to get a 21st century of consensus and compromise by design than to risk that we end up with a new anarchy by default. Thank you very much. <clears throat> My technique in these evenings is I read the book thoroughly. I read it a second time. I then put it on a piece of paper, all the points that I hope the speaker will make, hoping he won't make a few of them so I can say, what about? And I've checked off most of them here, <laughs> but I've still got a couple of thoughts. Uh, let me um, begin with just a, a, a small little anecdote that I was thinking about as Charlie was speaking. When I arrived here four years ago from the New York Times uh, at IPI, one of the first things we did one night was to have a reception for the then departing Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping, a wonderful guy called Jean-Marie Gehenno. And, uh, and he was standing here at a podium, and we were all standing around with drinks and things, and people were asking him questions. And somebody asked him a question, and frankly, it's the kind of question that journalists often ask, and it's almost unanswerable. But it turned out to be a good question in this case. They said, what is the most important thing you learned in the eight years you were Under Secretary General for Peacekeeping? And he instantly said, Remember, he's a UN official, international organization. He instantly said the importance of sovereignty. That's what he had learned. In fact, right now, and I don't think you'll quarrel with this statement, uh, we are living in a renationalizing world. Uh, there are 193 nations represented across the street. Um, each one of them has precious thoughts about their own sovereignty. So my question is, if you accept that notion, Charlie, isn't it going to be awfully difficult to make countries in this renationalized world think about things which may be in the common interest but may not be in their own interest? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it will be difficult. Uh, and I think that uh, it's precisely because we need to widen the circle and to create more stakeholders in the public domain that we should be more mindful of the need to respect the sovereignty uh, of other countries. I think I, I completely agree with you that we are going through a phase of renationalization. The nation state is coming back, and it's coming back because it doesn't much care for globalization. Globalization comes in and it just penetrates right through the borders and it turns upside down the socioeconomic orders that exist in our various countries and people are pissed off about it and they are fighting back. And that's why, let's take France as an example, both main candidates for the presidency right now are talking about protectionism, about getting out of Schengen, about reinforcing uh, uh, constraints on immigration. The nation state is, is fighting back. That's the world that we live in today, and I think we need to, to, uh, to, to realize that. The, um, you know, I think that the, one of the, one of the, aspirations that I have for an American foreign policy that is somewhat less ideological is that I think we will end up doing a better job of pulling into a cooperative circle the countries that we need to work with, like the Chinese, like the Russians. Uh, and when we delegitimate these countries through our rhetoric and our action, they are not happy, right? The Chinese feel that they are treated with insufficient respect. If our foreign policy, if we could find a way of making the Chinese feel that we accorded them more respect without broaching certain red lines, geopolitical red lines, I think we would actually find them more helpful on North Korea more helpful 
on Iran. I don't think that they would have fallen on their sword over Syria. I think that Russia and China vetoed the resolution on Syria mainly because they thought we overstepped our bounds on Libya. Perhaps we did. Uh, but I think if we're more mindful of staying within the comfort zone of key players, such as Russia and China, that doesn't mean we don't <coughs> object to human rights violations. That was, that was my next right? question. <laughs> uh, but, it all, but it means that we stop delegitimating them as states I think we would find the world a more cooperative place. But is, is there a way to do that without compromising completely some of our fundamental beliefs in things like human rights, environmental protection? I think that we stand our ground rhetorically, that we object every time that a political prisoner is taken in China or the opposition is beaten up on the streets of Russia. I don't think we have any choice but to do that. But I also think that we should get off our hobby horse of assuming that it is only liberal democratic states that look like us that are legitimate. Legitimacy comes in very different flavors in different parts of the world. And for many Chinese, they would rather have a, a well-paying job and a, the prospect of a, of a middle-class existence than they would the ability to go to the ballot box. Maybe 20, 30 years from now, that will change. I think we should be respectful if that is, in fact, the course that the Chinese people want. Let me ask you one more thing, and then I want to go to the floor. Um, what about the role of international organizations, and particularly of the one behind us here, in this world you're describing? You know, I think that, the, that there's a, a tension in how to deal with multilateralism moving forward. And that tension is that institutions like the UN and the IMF and the World Bank have to grow in size to become more representative and legitimate. The doors need to be thrown open. The G20 has already done that or the G8 has done that by becoming the G20, I think that inevitably the Security Council has to be enlarged. Voting rights in the World Bank have to change. They already are. But that also so, uh, creates problems. More cooks in the kitchen. It's harder to get the G20 to make a decision than it is the G7. And therefore, I think at the same time that you work on reforming global institutions, you also create new ad hoc institutions, contact groups that consist of the countries that are best suited to deal with individual problems. And I also would expect that over the next several decades, we will see the regional devolution of authority in the world. And that some of the most potent and efficacious institutions of this century will be ASEAN, the Gulf Cooperation Council, UNASUR and MERCOSUR in South America, the African Union, the European Union. And that if I'm right, that it will be no one's world and that they, we will see different packages of ideas dominating in different regions, then I think we, know, we have no choice but to encourage that regional devolution. And the policy prescription today is let's invest heavily in the capacities of those institutions. They are the future. Excellent. I would love to see some questions, and I'll just call on you in the back. Actually, what I'll do, I'll do three questions at once in the back. Mr. Karimi, did I see your hand up? And Anna Phillips in the front row. Uh, a microphone will get to you. Uh, by the way, we are webcasting this, so when you get the microphone, please hold it steady, close to your mouth, and don't move it, or else the sound will go. Thank you. In the context of your remarks, could you speak to uh, um, this? Excuse me one second. The photographer is asking if you would also stand up. So that's a good idea. Thank you. Sorry. In the context of your remarks, would you could, please identify yourself? My name is Frank Paisecki. I'm a private individual. Uh, in the context <laughs> of your remarks, could you, uh, could you speak to the success or not of our near abroad and in particular? I'm sorry, of our what? Of, of the near abroad. Uh, and in particular, NAFTA. Uh, and then as a follow-up to that, uh, why we struggled uh, in our efforts with Panama, Colombia, Korea in recent uh, 
trade negotiations that would speak somewhat to your, um, your effort about our policies. Can you keep that thought? And we'll go, the second was over here. Yes. Carry me from Mission of Iran. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your idea because being from Iran, as everybody is aware that there is tension between Iran and U.S. Uh, for confrontation. But in your own sentence, although you talk about cooperation, listening to others and all that, you said that if you cooperate with China, you can get better toughness on Iran. Again, you are ignoring 18 million new generation in Iran in international relations. I rather would like to uh, challenge your idea by saying that I see, you may correct me, I see a kind of shift in US as a sole superpower from hard power to soft power. I can give you a few examples. Cyber attack on Iran, drown, you know, a spy, spy, you know, airplane over Iran which brought down sanctions, assassinations which my country is facing. These are the points that I shift, I see a shift from hard power to the soft power. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Ann Phillips. Yep. Uh, yes, Ann Phillips. <laughs> I'm going to sit down. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I'm a member of the board of IPI, and it was wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm interested to know what your assessment is, the future in the 21st century, of this intense integration and globalization on conflict in the world. I mean, one could think on the one hand that the intense integration and interdependence could help diminish conflict because we need, would need each other more and will be intertwined so it might be more difficult actually to perform, if you will, conflict or to engage in conflict. On the other hand, you could think that this intense globalization will enhance uh, competition and therefore could actually increase conflict. So I'm, I'd be interested to know what your um, views on that might be. Take sure. Uh, on the first, the first question uh, of, of NAFTA and, and the Americas, I think NAFTA uh, has generally been, been successful in the sense of, of increasing trade and, in particular, helping Mexico improve its economy and build its middle class. Uh, but I would also add, and this to some extent will touch on Anne's question, that NAFTA and free trade in general and globalization in general has cut both ways. Uh, and I think that the, we, we were led to believe originally that the countries that would fare best in the globalized world were the most liberal and open countries. And I don't think that that's been the case. Uh, and what we have witnessed in the United States is the steady decline of the, U of the US middle class, along with the decline of the European and the Japanese middle class, because jobs have moved to the developing world. Uh, and I think that's one of the main reasons that we are now stuck in, in a, a political trough that the, you know, we are middle class societies par excellence. Those middle class societies are, are stumbling. They feel that the system doesn't work for them anymore. And as a consequence, we are, it, are, are facing societal cleavages and discontent of a sort that I don't think the West has really known since it became the West. That having been said, I have to say I'm surprised that protectionism has not been more rampant. I'm surprised that neither Democrats nor Republicans in the United States have really reached for that button. I thought, let's say, before Obama became president, that we would really be reaching for that button simply to cater to the swing states in the Midwest that have suffered the greatest deindustrialization. That hasn't happened, and I think it's good news. Uh, I don't think 
though, that we're going to see a push on free trade anytime soon. And that's because the West has always been the country that's been pushing on that door. And if you look at what's being said in the French elections, or you look at the positions of Republicans or Democrats in this state, yeah, we may get a single agreement with a Panama or a single agreement with South Korea or Colombia, but I think this big era of global multilateral trade liberalization is for now dead. And that's because those countries that really have pushed that agenda forward don't like it anymore, simply for domestic political reasons. Uh, your question, sir, uh, you know, I do think that, uh, I'll break, break it into two parts. You know, Iran, I think, finds itself in a, an unfortunate position today in, in that it is isolated. Uh, and the Chinese and the Indians and the Russians are hemming and hawing and hedging, but they are uncomfortable with the course that your country is taking. Uh, that doesn't make them always sign up to sanctions. That doesn't make them always believe that isolation is the, is the way to go. But I do think that we are at a critical period in the relationship and the diplomacy. Uh, and I would, I would put it in these terms. You have in Obama a president that is good, as good as it gets from an Iranian perspective. You have an Obama, a president who really believes in reaching out to the adversary, who I, in my mind, is ready to make a deal. And I worry that Iran is not fully appreciative of that reality. Uh, and so my message to you, and maybe you'll convey it back to Tehran, is don't let this window close. If it closes, I fear bad things will happen. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, has there been a, sh a shift to soft power? I, I would say that there has been a shift to a broader and more diverse portfolio and that during the Bush era, American foreign policy was over-militarized. We uh, used force excessively in Iraq and in Afghanistan. It did not produce the results that we expected. We have been pouring resources into a black hole. Fortunately, the Iraq adventure is over. I think Americans have come to the realization that the Afghanistan venture should also be over. But we should not have 100,000 troops in Afghanistan when there are 100 Al-Qaeda guys in the country. We should not spend $100 billion in a country whose GDP is $14 billion. In my mind, the war in Afghanistan was justified, but we have let ourselves get way too deep in and our commitment has vastly outstripped our resources. And I think Obama is doing a good job of recalibrating and getting uh, uh, a level of effort more commensurate with the resource, with the nature of our interests. And I think the switch to targeted strikes, drone strikes, although they're controversial, have really done much more to harm Al Qaeda than decade-long wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, to your question, Anne, I really think it cuts both ways. That, that globalization has a, a big smiley face, and that is that we are, to use that, that technical term, smushed together. We are uh, of, of necessity forced to find collective solutions because the problems are collective in, in their origins, and therefore we need to pull together. But I also think that there are, are downsides, uh, and they include what I, what I was sort of saying in, in response to Warren's initial question. The nation state is coming back. People are angry. Uh, we should all go back and read Karl Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation. 
which was about the rise of fascism in the, in the 20th century. But he basically said, when countries genuflect to globalization and tie themselves to the gold standard, they will feel whipsawed and out of control, and they will push back. And I think that's, that's what's happening. And we need to find a way of taming globalization so that it doesn't make electorates feel out of control. Because when they feel out of control, they get angry at their governments. Their governments become unresponsive. And I think that's partly what is, what is happening today. Uh, and then on, on uh, the kind of conflict issue, again, I think it, it cuts both ways. I think that we will see, because of globalization and its success, and by success, I mean bringing millions and millions of people out of poverty, we will see growing competition for water, for arable land, and for fossil fuels. And that competition could be so fierce in certain parts of the world that people start dying as a result. And I think we need to think long and hard now about that issue before it's upon us. Right, there are three more questions. John Hirsch in the front row, then Abdullah, and then in the back row. Uh, John Hirsch from IPI. First of all, thank you very much, really, for your comments and the book. Hmm? Um, I think that President Obama would probably agree with most of your analysis. However, I really wonder if he could go so far as to say this is no one's world, or if he could publicly use phrases like need to compromise, and accept the diffusion, diffusion of power without an enormous backlash. So I'm kind of wondering whether you think uh, that American foreign policy can change significantly in the direction you're proposing from where it is. And also, at the very end of your book, in the last page, you kind of talk about the possibility that rhetoric and policy can stay together and you quote a poll from the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations that says people will accept these ideas. But I kind of wonder whether that's true. And I'm thinking of you know, Mitt Romney getting up and making all these declarations that everybody here has heard about denouncing Obama for anything even remotely like what you're saying, just suggesting that we need to cooperate with other countries. And he kind of insists this is the American century, it will be forever, and so on. So I, I'd like you to kind of relate rhetoric to policy and the perspective you see for carrying your kind of prescriptions forward into American foreign policy. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Abdullah al-Saidi. Thank you. Um, Abdullah al-Saidi from the IPI. Uh, first, uh, I, I want to thank you for very lucid and incisive lecture. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. With respect to Russia and Libya, I think you deviated from the first uh, part of your lecture. I think the reason for Russia position in the Security Council, and for that matter, China, is polarization in international relations and the re-emergence of Russia as a global power after declined for some time. And I, 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 I grant to you that they used the, what they call the abuse of the no-fly zone in Libya. But my main question is, I noticed that when you spoke about history of the West, you talked about the Carlinaginian order, Charlemagne, and then you jumped to the 17th century. And that the period between these two, when incidentally Charlemagne was the ally of Harun al-Rashid, because Harun al-Rashid was undermining the uh, Eastern Roman Empire, the, the, the uh, Byzantine Empire, whereas Charlemagne will help him to undermine the Umayyad dynasty in Cordoba. But Baghdad at that time, was much more democratic than Northern Europe or Southern Europe. And Rome was closer to the Southern Mediterranean coast than it was to Europe. My question is, to what extent did the Islamic world, 
the Persian, the Islamic, the Indian, influence the development of Western civilization, including the political system. And the third one, and I agree with you, that democracy after the Arab Spring, we will have all of these so-called in the West Islamicist. And I agree with you because they were suppressed, they are more organized, but I believe that uh, they will win elections, but they will fail in governing and the reverse will take place. But I am hopeful because this time, democracy in the Middle East did not come because the ruler dictated we should have democracy. This is a grassroots movement and that is why I'm optimistic. But thank you again for your lecture. Gentleman in the back. Yeah, uh, Love Puri from the United Nations. Uh, with growing economic power also comes a spike in military budgets. So my question is like, you know, for instance, the, uh, there was a recent report by a think tank, British think tank. It said that Asia has already outstripped Europe in terms of military budget spending. What are the implications of this trend in like, you know, uh, on multilateralism and other con on, the, on other issues of global concern? Thanks. Sure. Uh, to your very pertinent question, John, I think that to the chagrin of, of my publicist, Lana Goldsmith, who's sitting here from Oxford, Obama is not going to carry this book on his way <laughs> to Marine One. And that's because his politi political handlers won't let him. My, my gut tells me he wouldn't disagree with a whole lot of this book. Uh, I don't have any reason to say that. I, I don't know the man. Uh, that's just a hunch. But especially in an election season, I don't think that he or anyone else is going to talk in, a, in an open way about this moment in history and in fact, he's kind of doing the opposite, right? He said in his, in his State of the Union, anyone who thinks the, the US is in decline doesn't know what they're talking about. Uh, and as I said, and as Warren said, I, I'm not a declinist. I think we will, do, we will snap back, we will do fine, but the world is changing. Uh, and we ought to have a debate about that. Uh, I think that the, that the United States is getting to the point where it can have a reasoned and reasonable debate about this issue. I think that politicians misread the public and that Americans are a little bit tired. They, uh, they, they like Obama's phrase, it's time for nation building here at home. Uh, and I think that if a, a politician stood up and spoke about where we are in this in this uh, this changing world, and 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 shot straight, he or she would find the public more responsive, uh, and I think that I think Romney is actually misfiring in this respect, uh, and that I'm guessing he did it because that's what the Republican base wants. I don't think it's what the centrist independent voter in Ohio wants and I would expect him to tack, but a lot of the so-called neoconservatives are his advisors, uh, and they're not down and out, right? And in my mind, they should be down and out. They ran the country off the rails, uh, and they, uh, they may well be back in power. Uh, I personally find that disconcerting. Uh, but I do think that whoever wins the next election will face certain realities, constraints at home and constraints abroad that will force him, whether it's Romney or Obama, to deal with some of these issues. They, there's no way out. And that's because our defense budget is on the chopping block. We have to deal with the fiscal problems that we have here. China is breathing down our neck. Uh, 
they will eat us for lunch if we don't start pushing back and being more strategic. Uh, and so this is all inevitable. But I agree with you that at least for now, the political hurdles of talking about it in an enlightened and an honest way are considerable. Uh, to your questions, Abdullah, yeah, I mean, I mean the, my, the, one, the one point I'd make on the, the Libya issue is that, and this comes back to Warren's question about sovereignty, I think that many countries around the world, even if they are supportive of the responsibility to protect, believe that it is in some ways a pretext for the West to do what it wants to. And they saw the Libya case as a perfect example of a limited resolution which they backed to protect civilians turning into a regime change mission. And they're very uncomfortable with that world. They don't want to live in a world in which uh, uh, we go out and sort of topple regimes by force. And I think we need to think long and hard about, about how to avoid giving that impression. I'm, I'm, I, I support the responsibility to protect. Uh, I do not support knocking off regimes at whim. On the Islamic, yeah, I think that, that there was cross-fertilization, but not a lot. And that during that long period that you talked about from the end of the Carolingian era until the Peace of Westphalia, let's pick a date, in 1648, the, the strength of Islamic caliphates and the Ottomans in particular prevented some of that dynamism that was bubbling up from below in Europe. The Sultan maintained very strong vertical lines of control. You couldn't inherit money. You couldn't own land. The Anatolian gentry was effectively decimated when the Ottoman Empire began because they wanted all roads to run through Istanbul. Imperial administrators rotated every three years because they didn't want them to go native. And power was so centralized in the court that there really was no ability of the merchant class, and there was a nascent merchant class, to push back. And I think that's one of the main reasons that there was ossification, stagnation in the Ottoman world when it comes to the economy. Uh, and entrepreneurship and commercialism taking place further to its west. Uh, I, you know, I, I think you probably are right that the Islamists will win, and then they will have trouble governing, because that's what's basically gone on through, throughout the region. Uh, what would then come, I, I don't know. Uh, but I do think that at least for now, the Islamists will remain dominant political forces across the region, and that it's time for Washington to start treating the Muslim Brotherhood and other similar parties as groups with which we have no choice but to work, and not treat them as pariahs uh, that, uh, that represent a, a political opposition. There, for now, the dominant political movement across the Middle East. Finally, the military uh, spending. I think it's, it's, uh, it's worrying. It's uh, uh, coming back to Anne's question. It, it, it is, we're in a, in a world where we, we are deeply integrated. We were pushed up against each other. Uh, and when you have militaries growing as quickly as they are today, then uh, then there's, there's more chance for them to bump up against each other. Uh, the, after the Straits of Hormuz, which is something I think at the top of our worry list for 2012 and 2013, I would say that the South China Sea is the most dangerous part of the world after the Straits of Hormuz. And I do think that there is a day of reckoning coming when the Chinese unfurl their version of the Monroe Doctrine. 
And it's inconceivable to me that a, that a country that is the world's number one country economically will not want to enjoy naval hegemony in its waters. And right now, those waters are a parking lot for the US Navy. Uh, and so I think that this is the decade where the US and China need to work to de-escalate their geopolitical confrontation. And then that region, that what they call the first island chain, the Chinese coast outward to Japan, Okinawa, the Philippines, and into Southeast Asia, we need to find a, a modus vivendi, a way forward there. Because right now we're on a collision course. Uh, and, and I think that, that the military spending that's taking place in that part of the world is in part indicative of the fact that everyone in that region thinks we're on a collision course and is getting ready for that day. Now is the time for diplomacy. Before I take one last, is this working? Before I take one last question, I just want to say a couple of things. Number one, books are for sale outside. I think I don't need to tell you after what you've heard, it is a terrific book, wonderfully well-argued book. Um, uh, the second thing is uh, the bar will stay open once we've answered the last question. Uh, third thing is we will also open the balcony and I think you probably accept my premise that Queens looks even better by night than it does in the daytime. Um, but, and Charlie will be here to sign books, and we'll all be drinking wine and have a good time. Last question. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Um, Diana Glassman, with, um, I'm, I'm head of environmental affairs at the US um, subsidiary of the Toronto Dominion Bank. The um, question is uh, regarding the role of cities in this tapestry um, at this moment in time before we get to where we may get to, as, as you've outlined, and, and you know, in the sclerotic state that we find ourselves today. Um, and by way of example, I wanted to talk a little bit about the environmental movement. Many people believe that cities are the solution to the water, energy, food uh, related conflicts that you um, started talking about earlier, and that you have examples of cities around the world banding together with the realization that they got to do it because no one else will, no government will. And uh, the question is really, is that a model uh, for other issues in this tapestry, or or is this um, is just it's really no counterforce, no, not at all relevant in in your world? You know, cities are the wave uh, of the future in the sense that there has been a, a striking urbanization of life around the world, and it's getting stronger. Uh, and I have to say that in, in doing the research for this book, I came away struck by how deep and continuous the urban-rural divide has been throughout history, in the sense that you know I was writing the chapter on the rise of the West, whether it was religion, whether it was republicanism versus monarchy, whatever it was, the main cleavage was urban-rural. In the case of Switzerland, for example, the rural cantons Catholic, the urban cantons, Protestant. In the case of Germany, southern Germany was agrarian. It stayed Catholic. Northern Germany went Protestant. In the case of England, when the parliament and the king started to fight, the south, which was commercialized, went with parliament, and the north and the west, which was still agrarian, backed the king. Uh, and, and now in, in, in uh, modern American politics, you can more or less look at a piece of land on the map, and you can tell whether it's going to be blue or red in the next election. The cities are generally Democratic, and the rest of the country is mostly Republican, with obvious exceptions. Uh, and in that respect, you know, I think I think it's that uh, that's you know this is this is going to be with us for a long time to come. Uh, that's not, that doesn't answer your question, but I just want to re just kind of put it out there because I think it's, it's fascinating. Uh, were, were you specifically interested in the environmental issue? I wonder if that is, a, there are many people in the environmental movement who do believe that is the answer, and that is, that, and that is actually the way to help mitigate the water, energy, food um, conflicts. 
um, that are related to this. And the question is, is that A, a viable model? Is it successful? And B, does it relate to other issues? And is that a way of bringing together these diverse um, centers all over the place um, uh, before we've actually gotten to the rules of the road as you, um, as mm -hmm. you hope we get mm -hmm. to? Well, I would say that, that the final questioner has stumped me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're, you're, you've hit on a, a, a topic uh, in which my knowledge is somewhere between non-existent and almost non-existent. Uh, so I, I'm going to duck. Uh, to the degree I, I know anything about it, I would say that to some extent the answer is yes. Uh, partly because I'm actually I'm on the board of a, of a foundation called the Harehausen Foundation, which funds something called the LSC Urban Age Project. So I've actually been going to meetings that are all about cities. And I've been learning about urban planning. And, uh, and yes, I mean, when you look at sewage, when you look at per capita energy and water consumption, uh, when you look at you know, GDP output, cities, are much more efficient than rural areas. Uh, and, and so that clearly is, is, is one way to, to kind of uh, get around some of the issues that are before us. But I have to say that I, I am uh, of the, uh, undecided and of two minds on this issue in the sense that one side of me thinks that on the environmental issue, we in deep doo-doo. And that as China and India and other countries modernize and industrialize, they are going to put so much demand on fossil fuels and water that we, we will face big crises. Sometimes when I read about new energy sources, when I read about energy output here of oil, you know, tight oil, tar sands, fracking, People are now talking about the United States as a net exporter. And our ports in the Gulf of Mexico are now actually already retooling to be exporters of LNG, not importers of LNG. And some people think this is going to fundamentally change the equation. I don't know. Uh, but I do think it's, it's an issue that is, is uh, going to be at the top of, of the conversation, because again, because we have no choice. Charlie, I uh, don't know what to say except thank you so much. And please uh, go to the bar, buy books. Thank you. Thank you.